That's cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, bass and bass playing yeah. and your kind of history as a bassist. So the last time that I saw you was when you were doing the Steve Vai tour. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of how that was in terms of you having... Because obviously, I mean, I was watching some of the DVD clips from that and it's a really interesting blend of you having to lock in as a rhythm section player and then on occasion just play wild, mad stuff. And a lot of the time it's... You know, the eighth note kind of grinding rock thing tends to be a gig in itself or your sort of feature mm-hmm. instrument. And how was that for you, having to keep on top of both of those things? You know, fairly, it, you, because we rehearsed so much and so diligently, uh, it really wasn't that bad. Excuse me, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, that show is almost completely through composed. Right. When, when, when you come up with a part that works for one of his songs, he looks at you and he goes, that, that's what I want you to do. And then you just play it. And, you know, there's a couple specific moments in the show where there would be improvisational activity, uh, but they were a small minority of what was going on. And the show is two and a half hours long. So really, after a while, it was just, you know, you just memorized and you just went up there and you performed. And uh, after a while, you know, even the most difficult thing kind of shows up like Mustang Sally. Right. You know, even though it, to, to the end, to, to, to the person who's watching the show, it's like, blah, 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 but you know, you're up there, oh, it's this part. Because we practiced, because Steve rehearsed us six hours a day, six days a week for a month. Right. That's one of the other great, it's funny just you mentioning that. Um, this is this is something that I remember, if, for those of you who don't know, Brian, aside from being a great bass player, a sideman, a writer, a composer in his own right, uh, also wrote for Bass Player Magazine for a lot of years, and I used to read your columns. And I remember there was times you were talking about various different things, even for musical concepts. One of them was about doing corporate function gigs, <laughs> where two bands had to sound check it to see all this kind of. And just you saying Mustang Sally is a. Re- it's great to know that it doesn't matter where in the world you are. Oh, it's the same bullshit reference. It point is. For- <laughs> uh, you know, and by the way, you know, I. Still, I mean, listen, I didn't put in years doing casual gigs like some people did, and that's just my career path. But I did do it. I had a band in college I was in called the Landlords of Soul, and we did the whole catalog. We did Mustang Sally, we did, you know, uh, Brick House, we did all the James Brown stuff, the Motown stuff. I mean, you know, I can do it, and I love doing it, Uh, even though nobody calls me for that gig, (laughs) except my wife. Nice. Because I play with my wife, and she's actually an R&B soul singer-songwriter. Right. And so we play as duo, and I am sitting there playing, like, old-school R&B groups. And I love it, you know? People, maybe they think, oh, well, you know, because you're the Steve I guy or the metal guy or the street guy, that you don't do that. I mean, I think that it's important to be able to do all that stuff, and I think it informs all the highfalutin playing in a positive way. Well, this, is, this was one of the things that really struck me whenever I read that, because, as is always the way, you know, I, I remember... Was Shampoo Horn the the was that the first thing you did? That was the first one. I was on a cut. Yeah, it was only Again, a couple songs on there. I remember seeing that in a, in a guitar magazine. I'm a teenager, whatever age I'm living in in Belfast, where nobody comes to play. Yeah. they're all too busy. You know, or they're afraid of being blown up. Yeah. So I'm reading this thing and spotting, and I'm looking out for all these guys, and then your name crops up again, and I start seeing that you're playing with different people, Mike Kennedy stuff. And then reading the stuff in the magazine and suddenly you reference doing a corporate gig, it's that thing where I think a lot of younger players are harbour the illusion that once a guy is on one set career path, yeah. like you once you're doing a big gig, all you do is big gigs and when you arrive back home you've got about twenty minutes to eat lunch before the yeah. next big gig calls and, and that kind of thing. And it's not well definitely in, in my experience of night for a lot of guys, you go off and you do the tour and you arrive home yeah. and it's like yeah. You know. Well, you know, that career that you're describing does exist, but for a very small group of people. Mm-hmm. Ve- I mean, you know, and and most of the time, the people who are doing that kind of work are not the people that you've heard of. Yeah. Uh, a couple of them are out there, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, there is a, I think there's a middle class and an upper middle class, uh, and, and then a really kind of like, you know, uh, uh, Oh, what's the word? The, the, super the, elite. Super elite. Yeah, you know yeah. uh, the one percent. <laughs> the one percent, or how would we translate it into here? There's the, you know the not the not the what's the word I'm looking for? The British word. 
Uh, uh, the aristocracy. Yeah, aristocracy. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Or the House of Lords. You know, the people who have the titles and all this. You know, yeah. the, the, there are a select few of those people. But most of us are. You know, we do well. I'm not complaining. I have a great, wonderful career. But it's very hard work. Mm. I mean, you just have to keep slugging away.